always by my side. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who is forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies. Good morning and welcome to our service. My name is Katie. We have just a couple of announcements for you today. In addition to the prayer that takes place uh, every Sunday morning in a Zoom call, which happens before this service, and the prayer that takes place in our house churches, we're now sending out a weekly prayer update, which will include items uh, that you can be praying over. If you have something that you would like the congregation to be praying for, you can send those requests to uh, info at capstontoronto.com. Also, if you'd like to be part of the prayer Zoom time or are not yet connected with the house church, you can also send an email to that address. Capstone Kids, we are starting a new series called The Life of Christ, and you'll be learning some amazing stories about how Christ healed people, uh, some of his amazing miracles, the great things he taught about, and more. And coming in February, there'll be something new that kids are going to be preparing for Easter, so stay tuned for that. Speaking of Easter, here is a special announcement from Tim Locke. Good morning, Capstone and Humbervale. I'm Tim. I've met lots of you, but not all of you. Some of you sent me guitar videos for our Christmas Eve service, and I thought that was awesome. Listen, I'm so sorry, but church musicians are kind of like Walmart. You're still full of Christmas turkey, and I'm about to start talking about Easter. I'm not actually sorry. It's the best part of the story anyway. Listen, we're going to put together a special musical celebration choir for Easter weekend. Now I say choir, and some of you are like, yes, reading parts, raising alto voices with the saints. And yes, there are proper choral parts and proper parts for you to sing. Everyone else, half of you checked out. You're like, choir, that's not for me. You're wrong. There is a part for everybody. If you can even casually enjoy singing along in church, we want you to come and join us. Go on the link and you're going to find something that's just for you. You'll see all this upcoming in a link in church communications, but I'm also going to drop it in the chat right about now. If you have questions or if you just need somebody to tell you that you're awesome, my email is on every page of the document. He is risen. Well, good morning, Capstone in Humbervale. We're so grateful to have you join us uh, at the beginning of a new year. And I have here with me today, Lothar and Doris, a beloved couple from our church family, who are here to help me talk to you a little bit about house church. Now, if you've been involved in either Capstone or you've been involved in Humbervale with us for the past little while now, you'll know that house churches are an essential part of the life of our church community. These are small groups of men and women that are gathering uh, throughout the week on different evenings uh, to have a time of fellowship, of prayer, of reflection and study, often on what we've been discussing in our weekend sermons, and to also just gather together for a deeper and more intimate sense of community. But instead of just taking my word for it, I thought we would have an opportunity to talk to some folks from our church who have been involved in house church in this season. And so Lothar and Doris, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I'd love if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about, about what your experience of house church has been like in this season. Well, it's been a very positive one. It's been very difficult because we can't worship together. Mm -hmm. And that sense of community was taken away from us through no fault of our own. So we have found that by attending a house church, we can start to build community. And when mm -hmm. we get together, hopefully soon, we will already have made connections with a few people. We have found that it's been very encouraging for us to get to know someone that we didn't know before. Had we met together as a large community, it probably would have been a little more challenging to personally get to know another couple or couples in our case. So I feel we're already ahead of the game. We already know these people, we already care about these people, 
they care about us. And I can also say when Lothar had to go through his unexpected surgery, it was so comforting to know that these people are praying for us, not just the day of his surgery, but before and after and how they stayed in touch, how they cared about how I was feeling. I thought that that was, as I said, very comforting, very encouraging, and something that uh, we are happy to be a part of. Um, just my two cents worth would be much along what Doris has just shared, but I think it's also great not just to get to know the people, but also to share. Everybody is in the same um, kind of dilemma in a way, what we're go all going through. Uh, we're discussing, yes, we're discussing uh, the sermon and the, pla the practical applications of it, but also encouraging each other, praying with each other, uh, as we go through this time of uncertainty. And I think that has been an uplifting, positive experience as well. That's wonderful. Thank you both so much for sharing. Now, like you mentioned, of course, house churches, you know, normally would take place in person. We'd be able to gather in, in someone's home and, and kind of have a more holistic experience of, of relationship and of hospitality. So I know some people who are maybe watching or listening this morning might feel a little hesitant about the thought of joining a house church that's meeting online. Um, but would you kind of maybe speak to that a little bit more? And, and how would you speak to somebody who's maybe uncertain about joining, knowing that we have the limitation of, of meeting on Zoom in this time? Well, I would say try it. Hmm. It is important during this time, especially to maintain a connection with like-minded people. And you get to know one another so you can be a little bit more personal about your prayer requests. And you're not alone that way. Hmm. Family is great. And we rely on family, as I'm sure everyone does. But this is something that we can expand upon. And it was nice for us as the only couple from Humbervale in our house church to feel so included. They have really made a point of calling us by name and making sure that they include us in any kind of discussion. How do you see that, for example, how do you see that from Humbervale's point of view? Hmm. So I really commend their leadership and I commend everyone for being so personal. And I think that anyone who joins a house church would benefit from that interaction. It's been really very positive for us. I would like to encourage people to join, especially if you are listening in from the Humbervale side of things, or even if you don't belong to either Capstone or Humbervale. It's been a positive experience. It's been encouraging. It's been uplifting, uh, just sharing. And uh, as you said, Lucas, for me, it's been non-threatening because sometimes if you get invited to someone's home, all of a sudden, this is a whole new territory, but you're in your house and this is a nice first step uh, to get to know people that way. And as Doris has said, uh, we have been part of two because the, the first one we belong to uh, split off because the numbers increased, which was encouraging. And the one we're uh, in now, we're with a, we are a group of eight, which is wonderful. And just to get to know the people, to encourage each other, because everybody's at different places at times, to share, to pray together has all been just a positive thing. And I would really highly encourage, uh, you're not alone in this world because we are so alone at times. Mm -hmm. And especially if you are a single person, I would really encourage you to participate. Absolutely try it. Awesome. Well, on that note, if you're listening and you're watching this morning and you're interested in trying it, if you want to try out a house church, we'd encourage you to contact our office. You can do so either by giving us a call or by emailing us at info at capstonetoronto.com. And just like Lothar and Doris have mentioned, there's no long-term commitment here. If you want to try out even a few house churches in an effort to find one that maybe best suits either your schedule or the overall culture of, of yourself, the families that you're interacting with, we'd welcome you to do so as well. So with that in mind, do, do take an opportunity to reach out to us and to get plugged into a house church as we start this new year.
This morning, we are starting a new series on the book of 1 Samuel, and it's called Like the Other Nations. And Rob, this morning, will be speaking on 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, you can join me in reading and bear with me as I try to make it through some of the names that are here. So 1 Samuel, verses 1 through 20. There was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah son of Jeraham, son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, the other Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peniah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provo provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And she kept on praying, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her, on her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. So good morning, Capstone Humbervale. Welcome again to church. Uh, as we get started this morning, I want to put a little context as to what day of the week it is. So for you, you're probably watching this on Sunday. For me, this is Thursday. And the reason why I think that context is important is so that you understand um, that yesterday was, was a historic event, and unfortunately not in the, in the good kind of historic events. Um, yesterday was the day where uh, the capital was uh, sieged and all of the events in the U.S., and so I'm coming to you um, in my time still uh, heavy from that event and, and just another example of, of the ongoing strains and stressors of the world that we've been living in for the last year now. And uh, when I was reflecting on this, I thought about looking back on years prior to 20 and now, uh, 2020 and now 2021 and how many times I had to start my sermons with an announcement about a world event, about something cultural that's taking place, uh, whether that be uh, weather, hurricane, earthquake, whether that be some kind of atrocity with a, a school shooting or whatnot. And when I look back on the 12 years prior to this 13th year of my ministry here, uh, I started to reflect on maybe one or two Sundays a year I would start my sermon by addressing something cultural that was taking place or an event um, within our world that was taking place. And it feels like every other Sunday, we're starting off with this kind of messaging of addressing what's happening in our world. And it's so heavy when you start to think about how many times you have to address uh, what's taking place and, and to make sure that you say it the right way and to make sure that you don't 
um, ignore it and you do address it, but you, you do it properly. And, and the weight of the responsibility that we continue to try to address, 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 address. And as I was addressing um, this and, and, and the events now that have taken place uh, this past week, I was really convicted by the way in which I am personally trying to address these things and the, by the way that I see even us as a church, and I mean you who are at home uh, attempting to do your best to, to grab hold of the complexities, the challenges, the addressing of the evils and the atrocities. And my conviction was really uh, demonstrated to me in the passage that we're going to look at this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 1 through a woman called Hannah who instead of trying to come up with the right answers or the right right way to address a certain situation, immediately went and petitioned God. She went to prayer. It's so hard for us to know what to say. And I find myself floundering with words to try to capture the essence of what's happening. But what I'm convicted by and what I want to challenge us as a church by this morning is that maybe our first response shouldn't be a response. In the sense that we understand it, it shouldn't be a post, it shouldn't be indignation, it shouldn't be statements, it should be prayer. Is prayer our first response as a church? Is prayer your first response as a family, as individuals, as followers of Christ? Or are we trying to always come up with a new answer? This week I was convicted by a barren woman in anguish who cried out to the Lord and God heard her prayers and remembered her and not only remembered her, answered her. Something I've encountered and committed countless times in tragedy is apologizing for not being able to do something practical and kind of wrapping up the end of that statement with, well, I'll pray for you, like as if prayer itself isn't something practical. Um, We ask, what can I practically do, implying this impracticality of prayer. But really, when we think about impact and change and how powerless we are to bring about real lasting change, then prayer is not the default, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything else to do. It's the starting point for real and lasting change. It's not the absence of something practical. It is the practical. And as a church, there's so much that we can't do about American politics. There's so much that we can't do about the realities of, of a pandemic. There's so much that we can't do in, in, in so many ways. We are so powerless when we think about our own strength, our own abilities. But if we have access to God in the way that we believe that we have access to God, then we are in a power position, not because of our power, but our access to the power of God. And so my conviction is that we start where Hannah starts. We start in a place of lament and request, of sadness and petition, and in prayer. Hannah is a woman for all intents and purposes, has no future. She's barren. She can't have children. Her rival provokes her. She, even, uh, even during this time where she has provoked, um, has this eating disorder where she can't even eat. It's so severe for her. She gets into this anguish and this anxiety, but then she does something so amazingly bold. She prays. She petitions God in, in a way that a desperate woman can petition God a desire for something greater than what she's experiencing. And the prayer of a tormented and barren woman would end up rewriting the history for the nation of Israel. It would be the starting point, the catalyst for the political and societal change that Israel so desperately needed because of the absence of their own spiritual revival, because of the absence of their own faithfulness. And so it's not through a coup or through protest or even through uh, a democratic election that new leadership is born. It's through the prayer of a barren and humble woman that a nation is changed and transformed to something greater. Uh, This year at Capstone and Humbervale, we're going to have an emphasis on prayer. Not as as a last resort. I guess we don't have anything else that we can do. We don't have the answers that we're looking for. But as a starting point for our church, And I'm encouraging you that you would enter into this with us as a church, this season of prayer, where we go to God and we petition him for the things that we believe that we need, because it was the prayers of a barren woman that would draw her nation back to God. And it's the prayers of the saints 
that are interwoven with the power of God that can bring about the revival that we desire to see so badly. It has the ability and the power to overcome the evils and the atrocities within this world. It doesn't take long to look around and to see that there is such prevalent evil. And our answer is not protest, it's prayer. And through that prayer, we protest that evil. We cry out against it. We declare that God is good in the midst of it. And we go to our knees first and not as an afterthought. So for the next few months, we're going to be entering into the book of 1 Samuel. And 1 Samuel is really taking place just at the end or the conclusion of the book of Judges. This was not a great time in the history of Israel. It was a very low time. Uh, the, the leaders that they had loved so dearly, Moses and Joshua, they were well gone. And, and now they were being replaced by these judges. And the judges go from meh to worse to really bad. And there's this downward cycle of leadership who are murderers, womanizers, violent people who do despicable things. And the people did whatever they wanted. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, this is the context of 1 Samuel. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now, for a number of you, you were here when we went through the book of Judges, and I'm hoping that you recovered by now. And maybe this is bringing up some, some past trauma of having sat through months and months of going through this dark book that leads us to where we are today. But it ends and concludes that in those days, people did what was right in their own eyes. They did as they saw fit. There was the absence of a king. And so the people themselves became their own king. The people themselves, instead of following the law, they became their own law. And as a result, we see that these judges would take leadership. And, and we end kind of with Samson and then into this real decline following Samson. And by the way, Samson is not a children's story. It's not one that we teach to our children about, oh, go and be like Samson. Samson was a horrible judge and a horrible leader who did ungodly things. He was a womanizer. He was a violent man. And the purpose of the story of Samson and so many of the other judges is not look at how good they are and, and how we should be like them, but it's drawing us to a greater need. It's leading us to this point where we recognize the full depravity that the people had no king and they did as they saw fit in their own eyes. In essence, Israel acted as if they were their own king and as if they were their own law. Israel needed a king. What they didn't need was a king like the other nations. What they asked for was a king like the other nations. What they needed was a deliverer king. They needed a loving king. They needed a just king. They needed a godly king. And 1 Samuel is a tale of three leaders. First we have Samuel. Then we have Saul. And Saul was a king who did not do right in God's eyes. He was a king like the other nations. And then we have David, this upcoming king who would become a king after God's own heart. So our series will start with Samuel. He did come first after all. And although Samuel would not be a king, he would be able to ordain two kings in his lifetime. But even Samuel's story doesn't start with Samuel. It starts with a barren woman at the end of her rope. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. There was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerome, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zu, the an Ephraimite. He had two wives, one who was called Hannah and the other Peniah. And Peniah had children, but Hannah had none. Right off we have a bat, a, part, a, a problem right off the bat, apart from trying to pronounce all those names in sequence. We have a problem, and, and the author of 1 Samuel jumps right into it. We're introduced to Elkanah, who has this impressive family lineage. This genealogy of Elkanah is a good genealogy. It's, it's a godly genealogy. And not only that, Elkanah doesn't just have a good lineage, he's a faithful worshiper. And this is the context that we find ourselves in, but Elkanah has a problem. Elkanah has two wives, one who is barren and the other who has children. Now, I know when people look at the Old Testament, they're like, well, what's up with that polygamy thing? What's up with the two wives thing? And, and I would make an argument without getting lost in it that I believe the Bible teaches both implicitly and explicitly in the monogamy of marriage. 
one man, one wife. I think it goes all the way back into our creation narrative. And if you think that uh, polygamy was permissible and you're having a hard, fi- hard time finding the explicit text, then my challenge to you is find a text in the Bible where it worked. Find a text in the Scripture where you see a man with multiple wives, where everything just went well. And here we have another, another example. That a faithful man with a good lineage makes some relational problems. He, he, he sets up a relational disaster. Of course, in this situation, the only thing that you could come up with with multiple wives is this sense of competitiveness. Two women in the relationship become rivals. One is the favored and one is not. One is the loved and the other is not. One has children and the other cannot. And so this may not be an explicit teaching against polygamy, which I believe, like I say, there are other teachings that would teach against that. But this this is certainly an implicit teaching of what happens when we set up something outside of God's order. And so this faithful man from a good family made bad relational decisions. But this isn't a story about Elkanah. It could have been, but it isn't. This is a story about Hannah and her relationship to God. This is a story about Hannah's prayer and a barren, humble woman that would change the nation of Israel and rewrite the nation's history through a simple prayer. 1 Samuel 1, 3-8 says, Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, uh, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? This passage demonstrates a whole lot of different things. I mean, one, it it demonstrates that this faithful man, this man with a good lineage, might not be the most aware man, that he begins to try to comfort his wife with, aren't I enough for you? I mean, you know that whole children thing? Can't, Can't I be enough for you? Can't you be satisfied with just me? It also introduces us to some key players that we're going to find later on in in the book of 1 Samuel, so I'm not going to look at them very much this morning. But Elkanah, this faithful man, heads to Shiloh to worship with his wives. And again, we see this faithful man make a significant relational error. He gave portions to Penina and her sons and daughters. If you think about even that phrasing, that he gave portions to her sons and daughters, there's almost this textual disconnect from Elkanah and his responsibility to his sons and his daughters. And he gave a favored portion to Hannah. If it's implied in the text that polygamy isn't the the way to go, then it's also implied in the text that favorism doesn't get us to where we want to be. And again, I would challenge you to go back and look at um, so much of Genesis where we see that favorites were a major part in the deconstruction of family relationship. We can see it with the the sons and with Joseph and on and on and on. Whenever favorism comes into play, we see an issue that follows with it. And so implicitly in the text, we have, have an issue. And so now we have Hannah, who is despised by her rival, and it's almost like Elkanah gave Penina the fuel that she needed to despise her. Why would she not despise her? She was the favored and loved wife. And so Penina became the rival the antagonist in the story. And it's a story of opposition and insecurity, this uncertainty. And this is where we get to the real crux of the story. As we start to understand what's going on, as we start to sense that God is going to move and God is going to do things, we see that God is responsible, that he is interwoven in this story, that he is connected to the barrenness of Hannah. The Lord is involved. Sadness is something that we all experience as Christ followers, and even if we're not a Christ follower, sadness is certainly something that we will experience. It's, it's an inescapable emotion and something that we shouldn't try to discount or to see as ungodly or something that we can't um, uh, spend time in being sad. Sadness often leads us to the place that we need to be, which is prayer. 
And we see that the sadness of Hannah is going to drive her into prayer and petition. She wept because she was sad and she had reason to be. And when we see that God has closed her womb, we, we can ask ourselves some questions about the character and nature of God. We can go one way and think, well, God, this is just not fair, and why would you do such a thing? But I believe the text is trying to draw us in a different direction where we're now beginning to anticipate that God is going to do something about it, that God is going to intervene, that God is going to intersect with Hannah in a very supernatural way. We don't have the ability to see behind the curtain. We don't have the ability to know what's next or the next act or the next part. But whenever God shows up in the text, we can anticipate that something is about to happen. And here we have that anticipation of something big happening. 1 Samuel 1, verse 9 through 11. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Have you ever prayed a prayer like this one? Maybe not quite so specific to this one, but something similar to this one where you get into almost a negotiation out of desperation, where you say, you know, God, if you would just do this, then, then I'll respond in this way. And actually, we see quite a few of these prayers, these vows that are made by individuals who are petitioning God. And Hannah gets to the point where she has no other option. And so Hannah does what Hannah can do, which is to pray. And she prays that God would deliver her through a son. It's a desperate prayer by a desperate woman. And, and here's the thing that I find interesting about desperate prayers. I don't see the Bible ever telling us not to pray desperately. I don't, I don't see in the scripture where it says, hey, when you pray, make sure you do it a certain way with a certain format. Make sure that you have a certain uh, posture or a certain approach to it. But there's such freedom for us to express our guttural aches, our hurts, our misery. It doesn't say that Hannah prayed because she was just so delighted to be in the presence of the Lord. It says while she wept through her anguish, she petitioned God and she vowed that if God would give her a son, she'll give him right back. She'll give him right back. These desperate prayers are a part of the Christian life. These desperate prayers are a part of our faith. And I'm not talking about the desperation prayers like, you know, it's, it's, it's the final seconds of a football game, so you throw up a prayer, and boy, good thing they caught it and God answered your prayer. I'm talking about the prayers that come out of a brokenness of the heart, out of a contrite spirit, out of this sadness, this anguish, where you just go to God because you have nothing left that you can do. Hannah had nothing that she could do within her own power. But it wasn't her power that would ever be able to deliver her in the first place. It was in the power of the God that she went to. And so she cried out. Now I want to skip down a little bit to, to see what happens as a result of Hannah's prayer to God. 1 Samuel 1, verse 19 to 20. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Hannah prayed that God would remember her. That was her prayer. God, remember me in my anguish. Remember me in my tragedy, in my hardship, in my tears, in my weeping. And it says that God remembered Hannah. And we see that there's this answer that he gives, and and Hannah worshiped God. In fact, before he's even given her an answer, it starts with early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord. I think this is a fascinating point that we don't want to just pass by too quickly, that even while she was still barren and had no answer from the Lord, it didn't stop her from worshiping the Lord. 2020 and now 2021 can really be marked by a year of loss. It lost security, lost stability, lost certainty, and lost community. But that loss shouldn't lead us to a loss of worship. 
We can look around and see everything that we don't have that we had in 2019 or whatever it might be. And, and yes, our culture and our society in this last year has experienced such significant loss, but the loss of worship isn't the result of other loss. In fact, she had still not been given the answer, and her first response was to worship. Daniel worshipped God surrounded by lions. David worshipped God while Saul was pursuing him for his life. Stephen worshipped God even in his final breath as others were taking his life. We can worship God in any context we find ourselves in. And in fact, where we need to start is in that prayer petition followed by worship, where we're able to go to God regardless of our circumstances and understand that He is still in control because our worship is not built off our circumstances. It's built off the greatness of God. And because of the glory and the greatness of God, we can worship while the city burns. We can worship while these protests, while these riots. We can worship with pandemics. We can worship with uncertainties. We can worship even when we lose the ones that we love because it's not our context that drives us to worship. It's the greatness and the glory of God as we encounter Him that draws us to worship. And so with all this loss, we cannot lose worship. We come to this place with an understanding of who is God. What will our church be known for when our children write our histories? Will we be known for our disappointments, our discontentments, our complaints? Or will our children remember us as a church who practices the power of prayer, of worship, and of mission? Now's the time that we teach our kids that even in challenging and hard contexts, we can worship the Lord. That in an absence of answers and the power to change, we can pray to Him that He would bring about that change. That we lead our children not through speak and what might be and, and hypotheticals. We lead them through prayer. We lead them into worship. We send them out into mission with us. As families, we go. And it's not so much about what histories will they write, it's what histories will they become a part of. What connection to the next step will they have learned through this pandemic, through these uncertain times as we call them? What, what is it that we are demonstrating to our children right now? Now is the time for worship. Now is the time for prayer. And now is the time for continuing mission. The Lord remembered Hannah. Just like God remembered Noah when the waters rose, just like God remembered Israel when they cried out about their oppression and their slavery and sent them a deliverer and Moses, and God remembered Hannah when she cried out in anguish and he sent a child. This again is very close to home in the season that we've just come out of, that God sends deliverers through birth, through children. Does it with Samuel here? Did it with Moses? And certainly we know that Christ came in the same form of a child, a deliverer. The church has not been forgotten. God remembered Hannah, and God continues to remember us. You have not been forgotten. And God is moving, and God is still king, and God is still seated on his throne. And although it looks like the world is in such chaos, God is still in control in the midst of that chaos, in tension with it. All of this leads us to the final words of Hannah and what I believe is the emphasis of our application today. With the world in the, in the shape that it's in and with us all scrambling to look for the right response, the right answers, the right post, uh, whatever it might be, what should we do? How should I respond? I'm convicted that we need to emphasize the activity of prayer as our starting point, not as our final attempt. That we don't get to prayer as a result of trying everything else and it didn't work. But we start in prayer and trust that the power of God is still real and still active and still moving in our world. I am convicted and convinced that this year is a year of prayer that we as a church are going to start and stay in this place of prayer in 2021. I've tried a lot of other things, and they've been disappointing. 
I've, I've even tried my best to act in wisdom and leadership to commit to the study and the application of the Word of God, and I think that I need to be challenged too, and I am convinced and convicted that this year is a year of prayer. And it's given in 1 Samuel 1.20, for in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. What an amazing name. What an interesting name to name your child. Because I asked God, I'll name him Samuel. She recognized that this was a simple petition, that it wasn't all of a sudden that she was able to do or accomplish something that she couldn't do or accomplish before, but it was the request of Hannah that would go on to reshape and rewrite the history of Israel. It wasn't in a, in a political coup. It wasn't in an uprising. It wasn't even in the appearance or the arrival of a king. It was in the prayer of a barren woman that would start the whole cycle as we move from Samuel to Saul to David. And when we get to King David, we realize that there's a line now. And that family line is going to lead us directly to the person of Jesus Christ. So not only did Hannah's humble and simple prayer reshape the history of Israel, it reshaped the history of humanity. As we see the line of Christ being built out as Samuel would be the one to find David and ordain him as king. I want to offer a challenge that I am simultaneously challenging myself with before we enter into responding to the next crisis, the next challenge, next week. And, and honestly, it's Thursday. I don't know what's even happening between now and Sunday when you watch this. It's moving and it's changing so quickly. The tensions are so high right now that I have no idea what the next two days will hold. But in that time and that time moving forward, I want to challenge you and me myself to be simultaneously challenged that whatever comes next, we start with prayer. Whatever comes next, we get on our knees as a church and our decisions begin with asking God, that petitioning of God. When we look at what we can do practically, we'll unapologetically say that we can pray. We won't qualify it with all the things that we wish we could have done, so we might as well pray. We will start with, here's the most practical and powerful thing I can do for you. I can pray for you because I asked. The history of Israel was altered. Our history has been altered by the humble prayers of a barren woman. God remembered Hannah and answered her prayer. We have seen things this year that we'll never be able to unsee. There are disturbing images that in my lifetime I've never seen before and now I'm seeing as, as we've watched so much of the destruction take place, as the certainties that we believe existed, the stabilities that we thought couldn't be challenged have been challenged. We've all witnessed things now that we'll never be able to remove from our memories, our schema, our, our, our understandings. So isn't it time that the church finally fell on her knees and just cried out? We need to cry out to God. We need to pray. It says that you do not have because you do not ask. Well, now is the time to ask. And so I'd, I'd ask that right where you are that you would pray with me. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer as our prayer becomes God's will here on earth. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen.